Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 7 as we continue our series throughout the gospel of Luke together. You know, C.S. Lewis, he once famously said, the most important thing about you is the way you think about God. Because the way you think about God will set the tone for how you live every single aspect of your life. This is why we study the Bible. This is why we come to church and open his word together so that we can think about God the right way, especially as we walk through the Gospels to see what God in flesh actually did and said while he was on this planet. And we're going to look at a few different stories throughout chapters 7 through 9 of the book of Luke, and we're going to be seeing some people asking all sorts of questions about who Jesus really is. We're going to see John the Baptist asking if he's really the Messiah or if they should be looking for someone else. We're going to see Pharisees asking, who is this who says he forgives sins? We're going to see the disciples asking, who is this that even the winds and the seas obey them? And then in chapter 9, we're going to see Jesus asking straight up, well, who do you say that I am? I want to untitle this message, Who is this Jesus? And my hope and prayer is that we would leave here today knowing a little bit better about who our Savior is this morning. So if you look with me in Luke chapter 7, we're going to start with this story with the account with John the Baptist. If you can skip down to verse 18 of chapter 7, and it says, The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord Jesus, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight, and he answered them, Go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. The poor have the good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who was not offended by me. Would you guys pray with me one more time? We'll get this a little bit further. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for moments like this where we get to gather together as a community around your word. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit completely take over in this moment. I pray your power be made perfect in my weakness. And Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to see your forgiveness in a brand new light, to see your love in a brand new light, to see your presence in our lives in a brand new light, Lord. I pray that even the simple truths that we're going to reiterate today would take on a whole new meaning to us in our lives. I pray that you would give us the right perspective. I pray we'd be transformed by the renewal of our minds today, Lord, and we'd think about you the right way. Thank you for all that you are and all that we get to be in you. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. And all God's people said? You know, I grew up with a very loving father. My dad was a great man, but he was tough. You know, he's a career military man from Philadelphia. You can imagine what kind of personality that produces in a person. Now, he was very loving, and he was, and, um, and he was a great father. But he was tough. He was strict. We did not get away with much in our household growing up. But how many of you know, when it comes to tough men like that, something changes whenever the grandchildren start to come along? You know, like... Uh, Rachel and I, our son, Fletcher, he'll be here anytime in the next two weeks, so be praying over that. Um, but this will be my dad's ninth grandchild, so he's a seasoned veteran in the grandparent world right now. But I remember when that first grandchild came along, my niece Kylie, she was a precious little girl, still is. Um, she's a teenager now. But I remember she couldn't have been more than four or five years old. My dad was stationed at Fort Benning at the time. We had a house right across the Alabama state line. And uh, her and her mom had come back home to live. And me and my brother, we were home from college for a weekend or a break or something like that. We were playing with Kylie in the backyard one day. And I don't remember exactly what we were playing, what we were doing, but I remember my dad came out and decided to join us. 
And I don't remember exactly what his idea was, but he suggested that we do something different, play a different game, do a different activity. And Kylie obviously did not like that idea because she just turned and said, don't be an idiot, Poppy. And me and my brother just kind of shook to our core. We looked at each other like, oh, no, this girl is dead. (laughs) This is it for her. She is not going to see the light of day ever again in her life. And my dad, he turns and he looks at her and he just laughs. He just laughs. He thinks it's hilarious. And me and my brother look at each other like, who is this man? If we would have said something like that to him, we wouldn't be able to sit down for a week, even at her age. Like, we don't even know this man anymore. But have you ever had one of those moments where someone did something that you didn't expect or it caused you to question the entire basis of your entire relationship with that person? It caused you to question if you really knew that person at all. You see, John, he's going through something similar here, but to a much more serious extent. So we talked about John a couple of weeks ago where he had this incredible ministry. He was baptizing people by the thousands. And the purpose of his ministry was to prepare the people's hearts for when Jesus' public ministry would begin. But then we see towards the end of chapter 3, and in Matthew's account of the story, John, he is now currently in a Roman prison, likely to be executed at any day. You know, sometimes life can get so difficult that we begin to question everything we ever knew. And no matter how strong of a Christian you are, we will doubt. We will all have times in our lives where we doubt our faith. I remember asking my dad as a, as a young kid, asking my dad, who was, a, who was a preacher his entire life, I said, Dad, do you ever question, like, if it's really real what we believe? He says, yeah, all the time. Even the strongest believers among us will have moments of doubt. John was probably the strongest believer around, if not ever. Jesus himself, he would say here a few verses down that John was the goat of all the prophets. He was the greatest prophet of all time. And think about the things that John had seen as well. He saw firsthand God sending him thousands of people to baptize It's not like he was out there advertising or putting out TikToks in order to get people bought in. People were showing up out in the wilderness to be baptized by the thousands. Only God could do that. And then he baptized Jesus himself. He saw the heavens open up. He saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove. He literally heard the voice of the Father from heaven saying that Jesus was his son with whom he was well pleased. And in that moment, John's entire life and ministry was validated. In that moment, he knew he was doing exactly the right thing, the right way. He was serving the right mission. But then he gets arrested. He knows Herod is probably going to have him killed because John called him out for stealing his brother's wife. That's why he's in jail, for calling him out for stealing his brother's wife. But John knows the Messiah is on the scene. He knows that Jesus' ministry has begun. However, he's probably still under the impression that Jesus was going to have some sort of political aspirations to his messiahship and that he was going to overthrow the Romans at some point. So John could be sitting there in prison waiting for Jesus to grant him his jailbreak. But then days go by, weeks go by. Months go by, he's still sitting in prison, and the more that he's there, the more frustrated that he gets. And so finally, he sends two of his disciples to go ask Jesus straight up, look, are you really the Messiah, or should we be looking for somebody else? And you know what Jesus doesn't do? Get all offended. Like, how dare you question me? You know why? Because God understands our doubt. God understands what you've been through. He understands what you're going through better than anybody else on the planet does. And you know what I appreciate about John here is that he actually sent them straight to Jesus. He didn't just find a bunch of side conversations or pick a bunch of other people's brains. Well, what do you think? Do you think he's really the Messiah? No, he sent his disciples straight to the source, straight to Jesus 
himself. He wasn't hiding his struggles or his doubts, and you shouldn't either. Whenever those times in your life come, whenever you're doubting your faith, take those concerns directly to him, and you're not going to catch him off guard. It's not like he's going to be up in heaven saying, whoa, you kidding me? After all I've done for you, you have the audacity to question me. Well, I'm just shocked. He's not going to say any of that. You know, in Jude, verses 21 through 22, it says, Keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And check this, and have mercy on those who doubt. Now, why would we be told to have mercy on those who doubt? Well, obviously because God has mercy on those who doubt. He sees it's coming. He knows why it's there. And he wants you to be able to talk to him about it. This is why Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says, instead of allowing anxiousness to take over, because you will get anxious, Go straight to God with your concerns. And the word supplication here, it literally means a seeking or an asking. So when you get to the point where you start questioning aspects of your faith, ask him about it. Seek out an answer from him. Now, I once read a great quote that said, we need more Christians who care enough about their faith to question it. Not just take everything at face value. Question it. Dig into it. Seek out those answers. However, whenever we do question, we have to make sure we know what we're really seeking here. Are we really seeking truth or an easy way out? Are we really seeking what he's actually like or who we would like him to be? Are we really wanting to know his heart and his values or are we just trying to find out something that we think could be best for us. You know, it's really interesting that the word translated as anxious in Philippians 4, 6 is used in other passages to mean to seek to promote one's own interests. It's almost as if the Bible is telling us that the most anxious you'll ever be in your life is whenever you are fixated on your own interests and lose sight of the big picture and what's really important. But we're human, And we're going to find ourselves getting caught up in ourselves and focusing on what we want or how we think things should be. And in those scenarios, we still, like John, need to be able to take those concerns straight to Jesus because we will doubt. And he understands our doubt. But then God will speak to our doubt. Again, Jesus doesn't get all flustered and frustrated that John, his cousin, the one who understood his Messiahship better than anyone else on the planet, was now questioning everything he ever knew. Instead, Luke writes in verses 21 and 22, In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight, and he answered them, Go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them. So, It seems like John's disciples come up to Jesus and ask him, are you really the Messiah as he's healing people, as he's casting out demons, as he's opening up blind eyes? And the two previous stories in chapter 7 are of Jesus healing a centurion's son from miles away and then raising a woman's son from the dead. So if I'm Jesus, I'm thinking, really? Really? You see me just give that guy a sight back. You ask me if I'm the Messiah. You see me just bring that kid back to life. You're really asking me this question right now. But he just tells them, go tell John what you've seen and heard. Blind receive their sight. Lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. Deaf hear. Dead are raised up. The poor have the good news preached to them. Now, this is actually a quote from the book of Isaiah when, they, when Isaiah prophesies about the ministry of the Messiah in chapter 35. And now this would have been so comforting to John because John would have been very familiar with the writings of Isaiah. Isaiah was one of John's heroes in the prophet world. John actually um, modeled his wardrobe after the way Isaiah dressed. 
And Jesus was able to give him a gentle reminder from the scriptures that he knew very well. Because scripture in the right context is the most comforting thing in the world. And as we saw in chapter 4, Jesus' response to every single temptation of Satan was to quote scripture. But now he shows that he speaks to our doubt by quoting scripture as well. And you will drown in doubt if you do not know his word. But then Jesus says something very interesting in verse 23. After he quotes Isaiah, he says, And blessed is the one who was not offended by me. Now, that word offended in this context means to be offended in one. For example, to see in another what I disapprove of and what hinders me from acknowledging his authority. So, this verse could also be translated, happy are those who do not stumble because of me. This is also a loose quote from Isaiah as well from chapter 8, verse 14, where he says, and he will become uh, a sanctuary and a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel. So even from the beginning, people have a tendency to get very offended at Jesus, mainly because the gospel demands a specific response, and that doesn't really fly in this day and age. However, many Christians have a tendency to get offended at Jesus as well, especially whenever things get difficult. Because we hear all about his love and his forgiveness, and we all get on board, but then there comes a time where we experience firsthand his other teachings, like people will hate you on his account. Or in this world, you will have trouble. Or take up your cross daily. And we tend not to be a fan of counting it pure joy whenever we face trials of many kinds. We don't really want to have to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We don't really like to rejoice in our sufferings. And whenever life begins to get difficult, instead of leaning on our faith for comfort, strength, and support, instead, we get mad at God. And there's no peace in that perspective. Have you ever met a person who blames all of their hardships and struggles on God? Is that person a happy person? Probably not. I'd be willing to bet no. (laughs) That's why Jesus says, blessed are, or happy are, or oh, the joy of those who are not offended because of me. And we experience that joy in him, even in the midst of the trials, because whenever we go to him with our doubts and our questions and our concerns, he'll speak to those doubts, questions, and concerns, and then we'll get to know his heart a little bit better. And there is nothing more comforting than that. Now, John was never going to get out of prison. John actually ends up getting beheaded there in that prison. But Jesus gave him the strength and comfort to endure by reminding him that there is something so much greater at stake here than just the troubles of this world. Because of Jesus' ministry, John, he didn't have to worry about the circumstance he was in right there because he had all of eternity to look forward to. But, oh, we don't really like that perspective. Now, that's not here and now enough for us. And, And we see so many people in Scripture that just don't like the way that Jesus operates. So they have a really hard time understanding why he does some of the things that he does. In the next few chapters, we see a couple of accounts of people asking, who is this Jesus? If you skip down to verse 36 of chapter 7, it says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at a table. Now, this is something I've noticed quite a bit as we've been reading throughout the, the book of Luke together, is that Jesus actually spent a lot of time eating with Pharisees in their households. Now, we normally only really talk about how he ate with tax collectors and sinners, which he did, but he even took the time to sit and share a meal with the overly religious sinners as well. Jesus did not discriminate. And This verse is a bit strange because it seems that Jesus just went straight in and sat down, or he went straight in and reclined at the table. Now, that's not normally how things would go. There's normally a whole protocol to these dinner parties in this day and age. First, you would enter the house, and then you would greet each other with the kiss, you know, like the double cheek, 
Well, kiss like that. That was weird to do. Okay, let's just get past that. Okay, <laughs> that's what they called the the holy kiss. And then and then the guests would have um, some oil placed on their head to kind of ease the harshness of the hot sun throughout the day. And then their sandals would be removed, and then a servant would wash their feet, and then they would go and recline at the table. So it's either that Jesus just skipped all of these steps, or it wasn't offered to him, which would have been pretty offensive. But either way, verse 37 says, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the at table in the Pharisee's house, brought, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair with her head, of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, to be fair, this is a pretty odd and awkward scene. You know, in that day and age, a woman just taking her hair down in public was so inappropriate and scandalous, her husband could use it for grounds for divorce. And so we have this scene where this woman, likely a prostitute, crashes this Pharisee's dinner party and is weeping and wailing and kissing Jesus' feet and using some very expensive and pungent perfume to anoint his feet. And Jesus, he asked down in verse 44, do you see this woman? Uh, Yes, everyone on the block sees this woman right now, Jesus. And verse 39 says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were really a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And then Jesus, knowing his thoughts, reading his mind, I'm just going to paraphrase the next few verses here. He said to him out loud, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, say a man had two guys indebted to him. One owed him almost two years worth of wages. The second guy owed him two months worth of wages. When the guy realizing that neither one really had any way to actually be able to pay him back, he decided just to forgive both of the debts. Now, in that scenario... Who would love the one who forgave the debt more? The Pharisee answers, well, probably the one who was forgiven the greater debt. Jesus says, exactly. He said, you see, I entered into your home, and you didn't even have the courtesy to give me some water for my feet, but this woman took it upon herself to wash my feet with her hair and her tears. You didn't greet me when I entered into your home, but she cared enough to kiss my feet. You gave me no oil from my head, but she anointed my feet with oil. Then in verse 47, it says, Therefore I tell you, her her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Who, now, who is this Jesus, they ask? Well, first, he's God. Him saying that he forgave her sins, he's implying in that moment that he is God himself. If you remember, Jesus, he had stirred the pot before with the scribes and Pharisees back in chapter 5 whenever the paralytic was brought to him. And instead of saying, instead of just healing him right away, he said, your sins are forgiven. To which in verse 21 it says, the scribes and Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can first give sins but God alone? And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, reading minds again, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed. And go home. So it seemed to be, it seemed that Jesus seemed to be adamant about not just claiming his deity, but also to be clear about the entire purpose of why he was here. But all the miracles and everything was pointing to the purpose of the cross. He didn't just want them to know that he was God. Who is this Jesus? He's the God who forgives. He's not the God who says, try harder. 
He's not the God who says, just be better. He's not the God that says, you need to do more. He's the God who forgives. Peter would proclaim at Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10, to Jesus all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Paul tells us in Colossians that because of what Jesus did on the cross, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his son. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And you see the difference between this woman and this Pharisee at this dinner party went way beyond just their professions and lifestyle choices. And what actually gave this woman an advantage spiritually on this Pharisee was the fact that she recognized how great her sin was and how desperate she was in need of forgiveness. And where this Pharisee messed up was thinking that his sin wasn't that bad. I don't care if the worst sin in your mind that you've ever committed was lifting a five-cent pack of gum when you were eight years old. I don't know what decade I just took us back to with that example, but you know what I'm saying. It doesn't matter how small you think your worst sin is, that sin still put Jesus on the cross. You know, John Owen once said, he that has slight or small thoughts of sin has never had great thoughts of God. And if we're not careful, we have a tendency to fall into this pattern as well where we've been following Jesus for a while now, we get pretty comfortable with where we are in our faith and we start to lose the awe and the wonder of his forgiveness in our lives. And what we end up doing is just comparing ourselves with other people, making ourselves feel super spiritual because we've grown so much. We're not as bad as they are anymore and we tend to view our sin as very small or non-existent. To which John says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, we probably wouldn't come out and say directly that we don't have sin. No, no, no. We know the spiritual lingo. Oh, no, I'm the chief of sinners. But the way that we live, the way that we act, the way that we talk, the way that we make unbelievers feel whenever they're around us, sends the message that we don't think we could get much better. And as a result, that will mess with our relationship with God because the smaller we see our sin, the smaller we will see his forgiveness and the smaller we will see his love. The driving force of his forgiveness has always been his desire to love us and for us to love him back. And whenever we recognize the greatness of our sin, we will acknowledge all the more the greatness of his love. Pastor Skip Skip Isaac said, our greatest need is forgiveness and God's greatest accomplishment is forgiveness. Let us never take for granted his love and forgiveness in our lives, especially whenever things get difficult. Whenever things get so hard that it may cause us to question if he still cares at all. This is something that happened to the disciples over in Luke chapter 8 and verses 22 through 25. It says, one day Jesus got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And then they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid again. And they marveled, saying to one another, Who is this that he even commands winds and waters? And they obey him. You know, I can't say this with, 100% biblical certainty, but this story leads me to believe that Jesus was not a morning person. And this makes me feel good because I'm not a morning person. And I remember like one of my best friends, uh, for the longest time, he thought I was just a miserable human being that hated everything because the only time he saw me was whenever I was rolling into work at 7 a.m. And someone told him I was serving as a youth pastor at the time, and he's like, there's absolutely no way that guy talks 
to teenagers about Jesus because he hates life. You know? and, <clears throat> and my my niece Ella, too. You'll see her around more. She's three years old. She is by far the sweetest of all of my nieces and nephews. She's always wanting to serve people and love on people and care for people. And she's just the sweetest kid that as can be until you wake her up from a nap. Okay? Her default response when you wake her up from a nap is to go, ah! and this is kind of what I see happening to Jesus here. Okay? He, the way I see this playing out, is Jesus getting super annoyed that he's getting woke up. He stomps over to the side of the boat. He looks at the weather and goes, shut up, or it could be translated, peace be still, whichever way you want to translate it. Okay. And then he turns to the disciples and say, where's your faith? I'm going back to bed. Now, one of the things that made this so mind-boggling was the fact that whenever he rebuked the storm, everything calmed all at once. Now, normally, whenever the storm would stop, the winds would calm down, the waves, they would still keep on crashing for another couple of hours, but not here. When Jesus said, stop, it all stopped. Now, Jesus, he, this is the God of all creation in flesh. John tells us all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Paul says he's the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created. Hebrews says God has appointed Jesus the heir of all things through whom he also made the worlds. He's the God of all creation. And we can stay calm even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of the chaos. Because who is this Jesus? He's the God who is with us. Think about the way this story played out. Jesus tells them, let's go across the lake together. He's there with them. He tells them where they are going to go. And then the storm came, he got woken up, and he didn't just rebuke the weather. He rebuked them as well. <clears throat> they were afraid of the storm, and now they're afraid again after the storm was calmed. It's almost as if Jesus preferred that they go through the storm confident in his presence and direction than having him stop the storm altogether. You see, the point of this story is not that Jesus will calm all of the storms in your life. Because he probably won't. Not all of them. He will some. But the point of this story is that compared to him, the storm actually has no power. This reminds me of whenever John gets his revelation of the throne room up in heaven. And before the throne, he sees a sea of glass. Which is significant because the sea in uh, the Old Testament was symbolic of chaos. It was the chief of all the unpredictable things. It's pretty obvious why from the story. So John's vision serves to remind us that God always has control, even in the midst of the chaos. Nothing is unpredictable to him. And whatever we may see as chaotic, is nothing but a calm sea of glass in front of his throne. So you're not promised a life absent of storms and suffering. I can look around this room and see those that I know have gone through some storms and some sufferings in this life. Harder than anything I've ever experienced. And we're not promised our life to be absent of those things. But you are promised that he will be with you in those storms and those sufferings. That's why the psalmist said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. The presence of Jesus is the most powerful promise that you can stand on in this temporary life. Tell me, are you standing on that promise? Let me ask you, who is Jesus to you personally? Have you taken the time to consider and ask that question? 
Who is Jesus to you? In Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 20, it says, Now it happened as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? You know, Jesus is going to ask us the very same question. Who do you say that he is? And that's the most important question you could ever answer in your life. Now, many of us are scared of that question, and it makes us nervous because we're kind of nervous about giving the wrong answer. And there's a couple of different ways that we can direct this question. One way is we can just make ourselves sound as super spiritual as possible. We can quote all the scripture we could possibly find. We say, well, the Bible says this about Jesus. The Bible says that about Jesus, which is all well and good. I'm not downplaying that at all. But who is he to you? Because you can believe all the scriptures say about him. But James says even the demons believe and tremble. And the enemy has no problem you knowing all of the scriptures you could possibly know as long as it doesn't personally impact you. The enemy would love nothing more than to have you impersonalize your relationship with Jesus. Who is he to you? The other way we may respond to this question is fear. Fear of not being good enough. Fear of not being accepted. Fear that forgiveness just seems a little bit too good to be true. And I'm sad to say that that fear is more often than not a direct result of self-righteous Christians. You know, I heard a story this past week about a pastor who shared a story about whenever he was early on in ministry, he was serving as a youth pastor at a small local church. And uh, one of the ministries they had there that he had started is they started ministry reaching out to some ladies who were, were dancers at a local gentleman's club, and they would minister to them whenever they got off work. And one day they had a breakthrough, and they got one of these ladies who agreed to come to church, and he's all excited. He brings this lady to church. She sits with him and his family. But then, of course, she starts feeling all the eyes. The whispers just keep going louder and louder. You know, like a lot of times those things kind of feel like they're in our head, but this wasn't one of those scenarios. And then after the service, one of the elders asks him for a meeting. And so he says he'll be right out. And the elder pulls him aside and says, son, we have worked very long and hard to create a culture among this church that will protect our people from women like her. And that pastor walked out, feeling so defeated. And he finds this woman bawling her eyes out in the parking lot. And he, he tries to lie and pass it off like that meeting wasn't about her, but she wasn't an idiot. She knew what it was about. And that pastor recounted, he said, how sad is it that here's a woman who exposes herself in front of drunken men for a living yet she feels the most degraded at church. And if you ever had, if you've ever had a similar feeling like that in church, I want to sincerely apologize to you because that is not the heart of our Savior. Not only was Jesus comfortable around sinners, sinners felt comfortable around Jesus. That woman in the Pharisee's dinner party, she didn't hesitate to get as close to Jesus as she possibly could. In fact, the reality is the safest and most secure place for a sinner to be is in the presence of Jesus. And no matter if you feel like you've been running from God your entire life, you feel like you've just been falling deeper and deeper into sin for years, the safest place for you to be is in his presence. Maybe you've had 
some of those things that you've just left unchecked for way too long and you feel like, well, I haven't talked to anybody about that sin before. No one else really knows about that sin. I'm just going to keep brushing it under a rug. I don't even know how I would bring that up. The safest place for you to be is in the presence of Jesus. Don't let, please don't let a bad experience from broken human beings deter you from going after a perfect Savior. Because He loves you. And He's willing to offer you all the forgiveness in the entire world. Why? Because that's who He is. Because that's our Jesus. The God who literally went from heaven to earth to pay the price that we couldn't pay, to take the punishment for us so he could freely offer us forgiveness and a relationship with him for all of eternity. That's who our Jesus is. Tell me, who's Jesus to you? Is he your savior and Messiah? Is he your forgiveness? Is he your confidence in the storm? Is he your strength and security? Tell me, is he your firm foundation? Man, I pray that the song that we're going to close out today would be used just to resonate something in our souls once again. I pray that the Lord would stir us up in a new way to appreciate him more than we ever have before in this life know his heart a little bit better. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for all that you are. Thank you so much for all that we get to be in you. Oh, Lord, I pray for those in this room that have been struggling so much with either hidden sin or obvious sin that we would run to your arms in this moment. Father, I pray for the individual in this room that has never acknowledged you as their Lord and Savior before. Father, I pray today would be the day they run into your loving and forgiving arms. And if that's you in this room, if you're in this room and you're ready to begin a relationship with Jesus for the very first time in your life, there's a card in the back of all the seats You can fill out that card, give us your information. You can check, I've given my life to Christ. You can take that card, drop it in one of the great boxes. You can give it to any one of our worship leaders, anyone wearing a lanyard. Somebody would love to talk with you and pray with you today. And Father, for all the rest of us in this room, Father, I pray that you would bring us to a deeper understanding of your love and forgiveness. Father, I pray that we would never become callous to the cross. I pray that you would awaken in our souls a newness, restore to us the joy of our salvation, Father. And I pray that we would never take you for granted. Thank you for never letting us down. Thank you for being our firm foundation and the strength within the storm. Thank you for all that you are and all that we get to be in you. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.